Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. It is 7 o'clock on Tuesday, November 20th, so we'll call to order the committee of the whole meeting. First item on the agenda is roll call. Rosado? Here. ATAC? Stark? Here. Chancet? Here. Silvati? Here. Wolf? Here. Brown? Here. O'Brien? Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Okay, we do have a quorum. Alderman O'Brien did contact me and said that he was going to try to make it, but he was tied up at work again this evening. And I know uh, Alderman McFadden and Alderman Atec were not going to be able to make it tonight. So we do have a quorum to conduct a regular business. Next item is item two, which is now the reminder for everyone to speak into the microphone so that those at home can hear us and we can make sure we get all of our conversations on record. So if anybody wants to address us when they do, they need to come up to the podium and use the microphone as well. Item three is approval of the minutes for October 23rd, 2018 and November 8th, 2018. Anybody have any comments or questions on the minutes? Can I get a motion? I'll move. Second. second. Motion by Chanzik, second by Silvati to recommend the City Council the minutes for October 23rd and November 8th of the Committee of the Home Meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Item four is items to be removed, added, or changed. Laura, do we have anything? No. Okay. Anybody else have anything? <laughs> uh, Jerry's not here, so we made the uh, wastewater treatment plan oh, up. Oh, he was out here. Front. Yeah. Oh, he's out in front? Yeah. He's just not physically here. Okay. Yeah. Scott's here, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they thought they had 20 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell them, smoke them with the gun. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to matters from the public for items that are not on the agenda. Does anybody have anything for us that is not on the agenda? Okay, we're going to move on to item six, which, which is the consent agenda. We have one item on the consent agenda, and that is resolution 18-128-R, authorizing the purchase of two 2020 Peterbilt truck chassis through source well contract in, through source well for a contract in the amount of $185,070. A memo from Scott Haynes. Everybody had an opportunity to read that. Anybody have any questions or comments on that item? Hearing none, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Stark, second by Rosado. We recommend the City Council item number resolution 18-128-R. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion's carried. We'll put that on consent agenda. Item seven, which is the wastewater treatment plant uh, construction project monthly update. Jerry, Mike isn't here tonight to introduce it, so if you want to just jump right into it, that's fine with us. I will apologize for uh, a second. I'm going to have to bring this up here. Usually I have it all set up. So while we're waiting, so the people at home know why we're waiting, this is a presentation that we have every month from Trotter and Associates on the progress of our uh, wastewater treatment plant rehabilitation and upgrades. Looks like you're ready now. I am ready now. One Thank of the reasons we're raising rates. Very good point. Yes. Say that and then put my face on the screen. So mm -hmm. right. <laughs> oh, <congratulations. laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, so this is the update for uh, essentially the month of October, even though we're uh, well into November. Um, we have been uh, fairly busy down there at the plant, uh, generally having between uh, upwards of 60 people on site during the weekdays and upwards of 15 and 20 on the weekends, namely Saturday, not Sunday work. But uh, there has been quite a bit of activity down at the plant. We've been uh, working on uh, interior MEPs, that's mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, and the sprinkler system in the main building. Uh, the main building has also started work on ceiling installation, little drywall and acoustic ceiling, and painting is ongoing. The process equipment has also, uh, the installation of those pieces of equipment has also continued. 
they've shifted focus down to the digester operations building when it comes to process equipment and MEP work. So that work has gone on ever since they finished the exterior masonry. The duct bank has been completed. Curb and gutter has been to about 90%. Sidewalk and asphalt is ongoing. They're actually paving out the south half of the site tomorrow. Underground piping was completed last Friday with a full plant bypass and a shutdown work that lasts until about 6 p.m. So uh, I'd like to thank the city operators for sticking around and helping us through that. I know it was taxing on a Friday afternoon. As far as costs go, these numbers are reflected in the uh, report that I submitted to the city, total of just over $24 million having been spent up to this point, including engineering costs and construction costs to the contractor. You notice the estimated progress number has changed. So we've talked about the fact that the project is running long. In reaction to that, I'm not using the contractor's completion percentage anymore because it's not realistic. So this percentage is reflected based on what it's really going to take according to his schedule because his percentage is based until contract completion, not where he's projected to actually complete. So the previous time I spoke to you, I believe that number was 86%. That was based on a completion in December. That's not going to be the case. We're going to be looking at February or March based on his mm -hmm. most recent schedule. We'll touch on that in a minute because it's, <coughs> it's about a 25-day lag. So... We'll touch on that in a, in a second here. As far as change orders go, no update on that. Still about 1.3%, uh, $339,000 in approved change orders. Now for the fun part, schedule. Last time we spoke, they had just submitted a schedule update where they had lost two days in critical path work and uh, six days... At that point, we're, we'll, we're remaining until substantial completion. That date has passed. So we are now past the date where the project should have been substantially complete or ready for beneficial use of the city. City operators moving into the building, taking ownership of the maintenance and operation of the equipment. This was the schedule that I received last week. Uh, instead of being two months behind, he's now three months behind. So in the scheme of the last month, he's lost about a month. I spoke with a contractor about this particular point uh, today. He noted that the item that seems to be pushing him back is getting power into the building. Getting power in the building depends on a lot of things. Um, the last approval that we gave for power coming into the building was city inspector approve the main switch gear that distributes power to all of the different electrical components eventually in the plant, but for now just to that north main building. That is a keystone in order to get things moving. It allows, <clears throat> allows um, HVAC systems to be started up. It allows the process equipment to be powered, started up, tested uh, for functionality. It allows power to be given down to the digestion complex so that your digesters can be brought back online. So there's a lot that hinges on that power. Since we're past substantial completion, what we've done is with every meeting, which we'll have another one tomorrow morning, and I'll do the same thing, we will tell them, here's where you said you'd be done, here's where you're now saying you're going to be done, and this is the cost that this means according to the contract as of today. And as of today, that uh, that cost is about $332,000 based on that schedule here that shows 83 days behind. I don't want to gliss over this, so if you have any questions, please let me know. How, how, how real is the power issue? I mean, what, what is, I mean, where, where are we with it? I would say that <clears throat> There are a lot of factors that affect that, but uh, what comes to mind is that in order to get the gear in the building, the building had to be built. The building was late. That has a ripple effect on everything. Mm -hmm. So you can't 
hang everything on subcontractors when you didn't give them the building until, realistically, they don't have windows yet. So if the subs really wanted to, they would push back, but they put the building up nearly 100 days past when they initially said that it would be constructed. So that has a lot to do with it. The other thing is the electrical subcontractor has gone through several members of leadership since the beginning of the project. They lost two project managers and a head electrician for the job. So they're on their third, fourth leader. So a lot of things get lost. So we've been doing our best to coordinate with him. Um, this particular last uh, inspection was for grounding and it could have been done weeks ago. And we asked him to do it and he didn't. So we've been pushing him. Um, this conversation again will happen tomorrow. But once we have power into the gear, that cascades a lot of work for the electrician again, because he has to run power to all the different motor control centers in the building and the plant. From there, he's got to get power to all the different pieces of equipment like HVAC and process equipment, things of that nature. Jerry, for clarity's sake, so correct me if I'm wrong, when you say that you've been pushing him and you suggested that he get the grounding done and things like that, that's not really Trotter's responsibility to push that. That's the general contractor's responsibility, but you were trying to assist, I'm assuming, and help him push the schedule by doing that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, since the beginning of the project, we saw the electrical power into the plant as being one of the most critical factors in getting the project done. So getting the building built was part of that. Now that the building is built, for the most part, getting it pushed throughout the plant is the next big step. So it's encouraging the fact that the contractor has had a dozen or more electricians on site pulling wire and, and cable through the duct bank of the plant, working in the main building, which, like I said, it's encouraging, but it's, it's not making up ground, obviously. Mm. But yes, that is not Trider's responsibility. That's something we've been doing as proactive as possible to try to say, this is the problem. I know you have a lot on your plate, but this is, the, this is what's going to push the project back, which is going to cost you more. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Gary. The, um, Go ahead. The penalties are purely on the GC, right? GC is responsible for any penalties at the end? That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> Set me up for my for my statement. Thank you. Um, generally speaking, though, contractors don't like to write checks for three hundred thirty-two thousand dollars. So expect some pushback. And Trotter has been doing a fantastic job of, you know, not literally, but almost every time they see the guy, hey, you're behind. This is how much you're behind. Hey, you're behind. This is how much you're behind. It's your fault. You're. Behind. I mean, we just keep documenting that over and over and over again, so that you try and take away all those avenues where he's going to say, oh, but it's not my fault, or oh, but this happened. It's just documentation after documentation to say, nope, this is what the contract says. These are all the documentations which get us to this point, and as Jerry just said, this point today is $332,000. It's not to say he's just going to write a check, but, but that's, that is what's all. And we've been able to back up those numbers too in case anybody's wondering uh, in terms of is that a realistic cost to the city um, we can back it up certainly to a certain extent we've put forth a lot of effort in inspecting we have two full-time inspectors out there and we have for six months now uh, before that um, it was basically one and a half inspectors so We've been putting forth a lot of effort, and that's a direct cost to the city. The other cost is the rental of the space for the city staff that are out of their home right now and the rental property that the contractor is using. Helen, um, the situation with the windows, are, are they not on site? Or are they not? It's a contractor's problem. He, uh, he did not realize the lead time for the glass, and so mid-December is what I've been told. Ooh. Now I'll believe it when I see it. Susan? You know, um, Gary, you said that 
we would we a, a general contractor probably would not write a check for three hundred thirty two thousand dollars. Then I don't understand because we've been through this several times now. This is in our first rodeo when it comes to damages, you know, for overruns on time, et cetera. Why do we have these clauses if we can't, you know, hold them to it? This is no. I'm not saying we can't hold them to it. I'm saying it gives us all the legal leverage. Okay. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I think I want you guys to be aware that there will be some pushback. <laughs> There's going to be some. Some. There always is. Right. I just I think you guys need to understand. He's not just going to happily write a check, but by contract, we have all the rights to go after open <clears throat> documents. Okay. Yeah. And, and rest assured, I mean, what do we got, 10% retainage? Yeah, we have 2.6. So we're holding dollars. retainage on everything that they do. So mm -hmm. it, it, when it comes time to settle the contract out is when these final negotiations will come to play. It seems like we've been in this place before, yeah. whether it's a piece right. of equipment or River Street or other things. Mm -hmm. We've had overruns, et cetera, where we're like, okay, well, it's in the contract, but... And there's always that but that goes along with it. I think with all the documentation, too, if they want to push back, we're going to shove back hard. Mm -hmm. I've got full confidence in Trotter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? No? That's Thanks, it. Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, just, just pictures. <laughs> <laughs> um, main building, last month, this is a shot of the north face of the building. We have since paved uh, along... Flynn and Chumway, the parking area. We have our overhead doors on our truck loading area, and the exterior masonry is complete. The south side of the site, another good view of the paving that has been done. Now all four of those large overhead doors have doors in them, so it's a lot easier to maintain heat and keep a good working space as they're finishing up the project. There's a look inside. The mechanical room, there's a lot of large equipment in this mechanical room. There are three units that are about 16 feet tall uh, that go in this room that have been piped and plumbed and uh, duct work has been run to. This is the large odor control unit that is in that, uh, inside that building, one of two for that building that will help uh, abate odors at the north end of the site for the sludge dewatering operations. Some of the work that's been going on inside, talking finishes now, there's a ground face masonry block that is in the administrative component, a third of the building that has this lab, um, break room offices, SCADA, server room, things like that. Blocks were damaged during construction, blocks are being replaced. Tile has yet to be placed in the bathrooms, but that is the next step. And laboratory equipment, or laboratory cabinetry, rather. Uh, has been delivered, and the block that has been repaired, once it gets repaired, gets sealed, and then we can put all the cabinets on the walls. This is the maintenance garage where they're using it a lot for storage, but essentially this maintenance garage is about 90% done as far as their, uh, their, their scope of work. Here's the Digester Operations Building last month. Is it this month? So they've uh, finished the exterior brick. They've finished the exterior brick on the digesters as well. It's sort of hard to see here. Uh, they had to scaffold and tent and heat some of that area due to t lowering, lowering temperatures. And they're getting ready to uh, finish out the waste gas burner down near the center of this picture. And like I said, they're planning on paving tomorrow. This is the piping in the basement of that digester operations building. It's very complex. There's a lot of valves. There's a lot of ins and outs in this room that the contractor has been working through. This is a large diameter piping on the other side of that room. So when I take you down there eventually, it is, there's a lot going on. So when we get down there, ask me any questions that you have. And that is the end of the presentation. If there are no other questions, thank you very much. For my Here benefit, they're on time, right? I'm sorry? For Mike's benefit, they're on time. And under budget. And under budget. <laughs> <laughs> so I find it kind of ironic that the, the, the biggest majority of the conversation that we've had so far about this, Mike, is the fact that they're farther and farther behind schedule. They're having a hard time to keep up. You know, and the reason why Mike is late tonight, he called me earlier and told me the reason why he was going to be late. He's 
in a similar business. He works for a general contractor. They've got a schedule to meet. Mike was staying late tonight to make sure they meet the <laughs> schedule. So that's what you have to do. That's um, part of it. But uh, for the benefit of everybody, let's make sure we all understand the process on Jerry going forward. Obviously, we would want to make sure, I mean, everybody knows that we want to try to get this done as soon as possible. But what will happen will be when the project is closed out, you're going to negotiate, you and Gary and Laura and whomever from staff will sit down and you'll go through the penalties and the cost and the reasons why and everything else with the contractor. And then you're going to come to us with a recommendation of what you think would be the right amount of penalty to impose on the contractor, correct? Correct. And it will be in the form of a change order. In the form of a change order. And then, obviously, if the contractor isn't in agreement through their sitting down with them, the contractor has all rights to come to the city council and plead his case. And we can go with what our our consultants and our staff say, or we can listen to the contractor and, and meet somewhere in the middle or do whatever it is that we think we need to do based on the conversations that are had at that point in time. But that's that's the process. Correct. Um, question for you. They're paving tomorrow. Yeah. And you're 90 some percent done with concrete and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some of the stuff that's being done, because I'm in that business, is now being done out of spec. So well, are they going to be asking for us to avoid the warranty because it's being done out of spec, or are you throwing this back at the general contractor because he delayed the project, so now it's being done out of spec? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, pavement, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, asphalt in particular, depending on the temperature, either should or should not be placed. So we've had negotiations with the contractor because the temperatures tomorrow will be below that point. 40 degrees is the number. So since we're going to be below that point, we've talked with the contractor about in what range we will accept what conditions. What is likely at this point is that he is going to pour in a range of 30 to 34 degrees, and he will give an extra one-year warranty on the asphalt in that area. He'll pour binder and he'll pour surface. Now, say tomorrow comes and it's 27 degrees, and he's not pouring. And he will wait until the spring, and he will do it, and he will do it free of charge, free of additional charge. Okay. The ground is frozen now? The ground is not completely frozen now. So There is frost. There is some frost, yes. It's also problematic, too, then, right, for a binder cost. Yes. I think that's very... That's a good deal that they're gonna, if they're gonna go through with it, they're gonna give us the additional warranty. Because I can tell you again, because I'm in the business, most people are just saying if you want it done, we're not gonna warranty it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like Trotter's got them to where you're saying if you're gonna do it, you're gonna give us an additional warranty. Absolutely. Okay. Good point. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you, Gary. If I may, just oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I, again, I, I appreciate the efforts you guys have, have done, but I mean, if, if through no fault of the owner, it's behind schedule, the owner shouldn't have to warranty it. Now, if it's no fault to the contractor, he shouldn't have to warranty it. And so if the contractor's warranting it, it's because he has some fault here not that we're looking to assign blame but he has some some skin in that game right i, I certainly can um process pipe wasn't completed or tested in time they finished the pipe on friday so they were working for weeks on getting it realigned and reinstalled after it failed several pressure tests it is on the contractor it's on him and so it's uh, he's he's doing what he should be doing in yes. essence it's i mean it's not up to us to say well, you have no warranty issues here because we want to get it done. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. And have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to move on to item 8, which is resolution 18-125-R, awarding the downtown improvement grant to Batavia Platform Properties. Alderman Stark. Thank you. Um, this is a downtown improvement grant and facade grant for 2 East Wilson Street, formerly 
known as the Tamley Building. Um, and um, we are not awarding a matching grant to John Happel. Right. And that was just a typo in the um, cover letter. Yes. <clears throat> um, but Chris Aston has put this together. Um, and so, Chris, if you'd like to talk about it, that would be terrific in terms of the expenditures and what would be going on within that building. Yes, I will. Um, and thank you, Alderman Stark. Uh, speaking specifically to the downtown improvement grant, uh, the request was for $25,000. The projects that are proposed that are grant eligible and are included in the grant request are to um, construct floor supports for both the the uh, street level floor. Well, I should tell you that there are four floors technically. There's an upstairs floor, uh, there's street level, there's one subterranean floor directly beneath that, and then there is actually a, the lowest floor which uh, was, was constructed on essentially a gravel uh, dirt surface. So uh, one of the projects is actually to pour cement floor on that bottom floor. But in terms of the, the floor support work, uh, they in doing an inspection, they found that, that both the street level floor and the floor directly beneath there uh, were not level and or were structurally unsound. Uh, and so they're proposing to uh, uh, do some work to support those floors and level them. Uh, they're going to be redesigning and essentially <clears throat> reconstructing the interior staircase. Uh, they'll be putting in, installing a new tin ceiling on the second, on the street level floor. Uh, there's new lighting. Uh, they'll be making electrical system improvements. Uh, they will be installing a new floor. That's the one we talked about to pour a concrete floor. And uh, they're going to replace the old furnace in the existing ductwork. So the total cost of that project, which is reflected by the lowest bid, which I provided the bids in your packet, uh, is $52,773. Uh, and they're qu requesting $25,000 or 50% of total expenditures, whoever less. Uh, we can get to the Vassar grant on the next ordinance if you'd like. Um, then the plan is to complete the project and make that the new home of the um, of their business, heart of the home, which is a kitchen and uh, bathroom and tear remodeling business. Uh, the staff is actually recommending that the downtown improvement grant be in the amount of $23,368. Um, and the reason being is that in the facade grant, uh, to meet their request at 50%, but yet trying to keep the project at 25000 all in or less. So that's why there was a slight reduction. Uh, both the uh, Jamie, both the Cokes here, Jamie and, uh, and Bill Koch, are present, and I'm sure they can answer any questions you may have about their project. Uh, were there any questions specifically with respect to the acquisition and the merits, the acquisition of the property, and then ultimately the merits of this proposal with respect to that purchase price. I'd be happy to speak to that. Um, Chris, I had a couple questions. Um, first, how much money is left in the downtown improvement grant fund? Uh, well, this will, if they spend it this year, uh, there will be 20, about $40,000. Okay. 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 And so then, we were under budget for the year. Okay. That was my first question. My second question is for. There's two things that I didn't see when I went through the packet. One is a certificate of appropriateness for the facade grant from Historic Preservation. And the staff determined that because the project is essentially nothing more than repairing the existing windows, mm -hmm. uh, that it will not have to go before, before Historic Preservation. So no COA was required. Uh, they will have to get a building permit, naturally. Mm -hmm. And Jeff and I have discussed it at length, and I know you had a conversation with a with Jeff Abertson as well. So it will not go through HPC because there's no substantive difference to the appearance of the building. Okay, so the, the windows that they're going to replace the current windows with <clears throat> will look the same? I'm not so sure they're going to replace them. You're going to repair them, correct? Repair yes. the sashes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And um, then the other thing is, is, don't we normally get more than one bid on these projects? We did actually have three bids. Okay. Uh, some of the bids were didn't include all the components, uh, but where there was a missing bid, uh, Jamie Koch went out and got bids to act as a general 
a contractor. So she was either going to GC it, Trademark was going to do it, and what was the other company's name? Um, I have it in here. RC Builders, right? Or EC. EC Builders. EC Construction. So I, I admittedly, it, it was hard to put this in a... I think I did put it together in some kind of a There were two matrix, columns. Yes, right? there, there was a trademark column and then a Jamie column. And, and so I wasn't quite sure what that all meant. So that's, so that's the, the compilation of the other bids, basically, with you general contracting. Okay. Right. The, the one project, they just simply uh, were not going to include some of the components. And even that bid came in at 70 something or something, right? So that was kind of blown out of the water. So, but we did have bids with respect to uh, co comparable bids directly on the HVAC work. So I think, if not the intent, the spirit of the guidelines was met here. I, they got bids. Some okay. guys just didn't want to bid on some of the work. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on the council have questions of? Um, Chris or Jamie or anyone about this project? Sure. Yes. Yeah, I don't have a question. I mean, I'm, I've reviewed the plans and I really appreciate what the quotes are, are proposing to do there. I guess my only concern would be that, you know, I think we've got, hopefully you've, you've had a conversation with them about out to the back of that property. Speaking we've got to the microphone. I am. Thank oh. you. We've got, we've got kind of a disconjointed <laughs> parking situation going on back there. And I, I take Laura on a ride about every six months, and we go down there and look at that parking lot back there with the bank drive through window. And, half, you know, some people are parking back there for three weeks at a time. And we've had people living in trucks back there. And I've had Rhonda down there enforcing codes on them and everything else. I, you know, I would really suggest that that rear parking lot there is a real candidate for a, a nice downtown improvement and some reshuffling and reconsideration. So I'm led to believe they're, they know that I'm on the warpath about this and we want, we'd like to get something done that enhances their property along with everybody else's there because, I mean, that looks like something out of I don't know what. It, it's like it really got a dire need of being re refurbished. and. I'm, I'm, a, I'm ashamed of the riverbank that exists down there going south from the bridge as far as the allowance of all this wild foliage to be built there and or cut and grown. And as most of you know, I personally went over and cut all the stuff down on the west bank of the river from the bridge down to the islands. And if I keep seeing that, I'll be down there one of these years myself, although I'm getting too old to get down there and get poison ivy like I did on the west side. But uh, that that really is could be a very much more spectacular view of the river and enhancement from the bridge and everything else if we could just get that parking lot and that riverbank cleaned up down there to be something that Batavia could be proud of. How many different owners do we have on that? Uh, there's a bunch of them down there, and these folks are you know new to the game, and they're not they've not been a problem that I've ever heard. So I'm not pointing this conversation at that. I'm just sharing this with the city council that I think, you know, we've had these meetings going on about river bank enhancement through the downtown area. This is really one of the real last of the eyesores that's left that really needs some attention. And I think we can do something good with the parking lot to support the businesses along Wilson Street. And we can do something good along that area. As you may know, uh, we are demoing it the next few days, two of the houses south of this right on River Street uh, between Webster and Adams. There's, and those were bought with proceeds from the Phil Elstrom estate by the Park District because Mr. Elstrom's desire was to take all those houses on the west side of River Street from this parking lot all the way down to the old baseball park out of there so that there's this big vista of Fox River View and park that would be enjoyed by everybody in town. So I think it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, there is some Elstrom money left to do some more stuff there. And so I just think that we should do everything we can to continue to be on the spirit of cleaning that area up. I guess what I'm wondering, Mayor, is I know it's the city owns a small portion of it, Park District owns a small portion, and then there's a couple private owners, correct? Just one. <coughs> just one? Yes, and so, um, the city is in um, 
we're negotiating with the park district right now to swap some parking spaces that we own that are adjacent to their administration building that's on the west side right. for the parking spaces that are in the uh, parking lot adjacent to Marconi's property. And we're hoping to um, cooperate with the private owner in order to refurbish that parking lot and establish those spaces that are not needed for private businesses as additional public parking in our downtown area. So I guess what I'm wondering is, um, I don't know if improvements to a parking lot would fall within the guidelines of downtown improvement grant. Well, I'm not that, saying they are. I don't I, argue I know, that. I, I know. That they're, I just, they're, they're not eligible, but they are TIF eligible expenses. Mm -hmm. They're not eligible under that. Okay, because what I was getting at was if there's, say, 40000 left in this year's budget, and I guess what I was getting at was could we just go ahead, I mean, this has been a topic of conversation for the last eight years. Right. And could we just go ahead and apply the downtown budget that's left over plus maybe whatever it takes next year to get that thing taken care of and use it as a downtown improvement? We could. That it's a, would be a private improvement. I think we'd probably accomplish it through a redevelopment agreement. It, it, again, it's an eligible cost within the TIF statute. As, uh, as Laura indicated, there's a few different property owners. The city, well, we no longer own the two or two parking spaces or three parking spaces immediately behind your building, depending on how it was ever striped. Uh, we do own a kind of a east-west alleyway that is directly adjacent to the drive-up window. That's, that's the public access back to the park district. Without that public access back to the park district spaces, which align the river, uh, perpendicular along the river uh, line, um, you'd have no public access to them because the rest of the of the land is owned by Marconi, and so it'd be kind of a public-private. You wouldn't want to do it separately, obviously, as you said. You do it comprehensively, all of it, uh, probably grind and resurface some of it. If not, I think just you know, crack filling and pothole is not going to make it work. That's just a waste of money. So it would be a pretty comprehensive program. I have to work with Gary on it. Uh, but yeah, we we may have one more grant request yet this fiscal year, um, but we'll be able to accommodate in the existing budget. But it would affect the you know the improvement you're talking about. So it sounds like if we get this land swap done mm -hmm. with the park district, we'll be closer to being able to yes get this parking yes. lot taken care of definitely some way somehow. Yeah, you know, I just as long as we got everybody here and we're talking about this, I just want to recall some history for those many of you who weren't on the council at the time. When we rebuilt the Wilson Street Bridge, we had to do it over a two-year period of time because we had to keep two of the lanes open so that people could continue to cross during the construction. So this was a long, drawn-out process, and there's a lot of photographs of, you know, the storefronts in front of this building that they're talking about with no street in front of it and the gully there and all this good stuff. At the end of the day, at the time this was going on, as many of you may remember, uh, Batavia was fortunate at that moment to have as a downtown tenant the Speaker of the House of the U.S. Congress. And so, uh, as you also may remember, we became the center of attention by every demonstrator in the United States of America that wanted to come and protest some aspect of federal government, Social Security, immigration, wars in the Middle East, uh, endless list. And so there were 58 times, as I remember the final number, that we had to mobilize the members of the Batavia Police Department to go over to the Speaker's office and either stand in front of it or bring everybody into order or take handcuffs off of somebody who would handcuff themselves to the furniture inside the building. I mean, this was an ongoing operation. So as you may further remember, uh, through some relationships I had through CMAP, and through this Hastert situation, uh, we got enough money from the federal government to rebuild the Wilson Street Bridge so that the taxpayers of Batavia at the end of the day only had to pay for 13% of the total cost of that bridge replacement. The rest of it was borne by the state and federal government. So in the waning days of Mr. Hastert, uh, before he left the speakership, he called me up one day and asked me to come over. And he was still feeling obligated to Batavia for what we had done for him with all these demonstrations and ambulances were over there with people having fainting spells while they were demonstrating. So he wanted to do something special for the Batavia police and the fire department. 
And so he indicated to me that he would get us an 80% federal grant to buy that fire department ladder truck that you see running around Batavia with the bucket on the end of it. So he provided 80% of the funding to buy that truck. Now it's about a million dollar vehicle. So we got that pretty good. But then he said he wanted to do something special for the Batavia Police Department. And he didn't want to have any partial grant. He wanted to do pay for the whole thing. So he had me call the police chief at the time, who was Dennis Anderson. And Chief Anderson said, well, we've got this uh, need. We'd like to have a computerized uh, record system that we mount inside the squad car so the guys can enter license plates or contact the Secretary of State or law enforcement agency data system and see if somebody's a criminal and all this right in the car. So he told me it was about $780,000 to outfit all the Batavia cars. So I went back to the speaker and said, well, that please, he says, I'll pay for the whole thing. So he paid for the whole thing. So then he says to me, I really think I owe Batavia something for all the interruptions we've had here. What would you like? So that's, I use that opportunity to say, I think we'd like to have sidewalks underneath the new bridge with lights on them that would someday ho hopefully access the bicycle trail and allow us to move the bikes down there. And we'd like to have it on both the east and the west sides. And we'd like to have four scenic outlooks on the, on the top of the bridge where you can display art and whatever have you. So he says, how much is this going to cost? And I says, well, you know, I had to call up and talk to the public works director at the time, and it was about $850,000. So I got back to him with that number. He says, tell him to go ahead and do it. It'll be paid for. So, you know, we, we got the start over there next to this building because, you know, we had that whole area rebuilt, got you know, a new stairway in, we got the lights underneath there. We, You know, there's going to be a lot of lower body attention to that store, to that area, because we now have all these thousands of bicycle riders going by there when we get the final leg of the bike trail up there on the Larson and Becker property. So this has been a long-term commitment by the city to do this, and, you know, I'm just wanting to make sure that these folks, and I know they, I'm pretty sure they are, are in line that we're here to try to really jazz up that area down there around that, that property and really make it a center of attraction for the thousands of visitors that we get into Batavia every year riding the bicycle trail now. And so that's why I'm harking on this tonight because this really is, you know, a long time coming together, special thing. And I mean, lo and behold, nobody guessed we were going to have the Speaker of the House of the U.S. Congress in here for eight years, but we were. And I want to tell you, any district that gets the speakership, you better grab everything you can. So I'm sure Janesville, Wisconsin's done real well here in the last few years with Ryan in the office, as probably Pelosi's uh, district out in San Francisco has done very good because, uh, you know, the speaker seems to have really great abilities to deliver on funding. And so we took great advantage of it. I'm very proud we did. I have no apologies to make. And I think Batavia today and in the future is going to be a brighter and and more polished place because we were able to take advantage of all that. Mm -hmm. I'm done. <clears throat> well, I appreciate those <laughs> comments, and I think the Cokes do as well because uh, some of our conversations have also been surrounding the rear of the building. Uh, it's not part of this grant, and I assume it's in another phase as they uh, pay down their debt that uh, they'll be looking at the, uh, the uh, south side building and try to restore some of the image of the original Depot building, correct? So that's not part of this grant, but they've said it not just now because they were pressed to, but they, they, they talked about it when you'll recall their uh, being awarded the proposal, I should say. Uh, they, they had done the RFP in order to purchase the property, and they mentioned it then too. So at this, at this juncture, I would ask that there be a motion uh, on the first one. The Alderman Stark, I'm, uh, 18 125. You don't get to ask that. <laughs> Just trying to move it along. No, does anyone else have any questions of Chris? Okay. So, would someone like to make a motion to recommend a City Council Resolution 18 125 R awarding a downtown improvement matching grant um, in the amount of $23,368 or 50% of actual project costs, whichever is the lesser amount? So moved. So moved. Second. Motion by Silvati, second by Ewer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Let's talk about it. Yes, absolutely. And make sure, Chris, that you change the uh, yes 
Very Pebble happy to uh, Coke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I caught it everywhere else, but apparently that was a, I apologize for that. <laughs> um, and that'll be done for the December 3rd meeting, I believe. Is that correct? Or yes. December 3rd, yes. Uh, and finally, going to uh, 18 uh, the you know, previously described uh, window work. Uh, that, that is the essence of the uh, facade grant. It's an eligible expense under facade. Uh, as, as Ms. Stark noted, uh, the COA would otherwise be applicable, but in this case, uh, because there's no substantive change to the appearance of the building, uh, and they're not replacing the windows, but instead just repairing them, uh, there's no HPC re required review for a COA. Okay, thank you. Would someone like to make a motion to recommend a council resolution 18-126-R awarding a facade improvement matching grant in the amount of $1,632 or 50% of actual project costs, whichever is the lesser amount? So moved. Second. Motion by Silvati, second by Callahan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries, and that'll also go on the regular agenda, so we can talk about the improvements to the building. So, Chris, if they don't get it done this year, that means those funds do not come out of this year's budget, and it rolls into next year. And those will be carried over to next year, correct? Mm -hmm. And it won't affect the. Well, the budget hasn't been approved yet, right? But but the budget calls for hundred thousand dollars in the program again next year. We were thinking about having to reduce that. Depending on the results of the of the elect or the, uh, the yeah. home rule question, mm -hmm. but that I believe that hundred thousand stays in place. So that this money will not uh, will not come out of next year's hundred thousand, but will carry over this year's portion. Does the unused amount roll over too? Yes. Okay. You don't have to do that, but in this case, because we're committed. Yeah. No, but I meant. Let's say there was an additional. Twenty thousand dollars. Does next year become one hundred and twenty thousand dollars because it we, carried over? We left it in the TIF, but we haven't allocated it towards a downtown improvement grant. Okay. So for next year's purposes, I will still consider the th hundred thousand being the ceiling for grants. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. All right. We're going to move on then to ordinance um, eighteen sixty eight, authorizing surplus of police department vehicles. And that is Alderman Wolf. Thank you. Um, this, I believe, is for our final three Crown Victorias to be uh, sold. Um, so we've got three of them. They are all uh, uh, one's a little bit below a hundred thousand. Alan, pull the mic up. By you. They're all um, <laughs> at or above a hundred thousand miles, and they're all at, at least fifty percent of uh, the vehicle purchase price and maintenance on them. So they all meet the criteria that we would get rid of them. Um, I'm sure some of the department are probably sad, sad to see those go, but uh, see if we can get as much money for those as we got for the uh, old truck from Mazda. So those will be going out for uh, auction. Anybody have any questions? Can I just make a comment? Sure. Um, there was a question on Facebook that had to do with police vehicles and that um, there was a perception that there being only 100,000 miles on them, mm -hmm. that the typical consumer vehicle, we keep our vehicles in excess of 100,000 miles. But the police vehicles, and especially those that are um, used as part of the marked fleet, mm -hmm. are working around the clock. They're, they're hardly ever even turned off. Um, and so it's really that engine, engine idle time that um, puts a lot of wear and tear on the engine so that after 100,000 miles, you can see where the maintenance costs have are more than 50% of the current market value of the vehicle. Marty? Yeah, and I agree with that having, it, it just, <laughs> the car just keeps moving shift after shift after shift. And to that, to anybody that would question that. If you were gonna buy a used car, would you buy a used car that is $100,000 from a residential family? Or are you gonna buy a taxi police car to drive around in as your, as your uh, new car? You're not, Depends if you're Jake or Elwood Blues. You're not gonna do that. <laughs> so you traded it for a microphone. Okay. Anybody care to make a motion or recommend to council uh, the surplus vehicles? Those three vehicles? So moved. so moved. Second. Motion by Meitzler, second by Callahan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That can go on consent. Yep. Okay. 
Moving on then to item 11, which is the 2019 budget. Laura, we're just gonna go straight with you. Sure, um, included with the agenda was uh, Peggy Colby's memo. Um, she cannot be here tonight, but I would be happy to walk through um, the information. At the last meeting, Peggy had not yet calculated um, precisely what the increase would be um, considering the EAV. Um, if we were to keep the percentage levied the same, um, but look at what increase there had been in the EAV. She had previously estimated only 50,000 and it turned out to be 140,000. So um, that, that's very good news. And um, so for instance, uh, if the city was uh, utilizing the, the tax cap rules, um, they would be able to levy $200,000 utilizing the um, non-home rule tax cap rules. So that 140,000 is well below what um, the tax cap rules would allow. Um, she also included a page where uh, she said, you know, she has yes and no columns for the items that had previously previously been discussed and agreed upon, but um, those items that are marked in yellow on that page are items that we should discuss tonight and make sure that everyone is in, in agreement about because those items then will become part of the ordinance that uh, will be subject to the public hearing next Tuesday evening and be voted upon um, in the 2019 budget. And so uh, just walking through this chart, uh, the first is to add the IT technician in March of 2019. Um, the budget impact is $94,354, including wages, FICA, IMRF, and health insurance. And um, adding the IT technician allows us to delete the funding for contractual assistance in IT in an amount of $30,000. And also mentioned as part of uh, last week's budget meeting, they, we're going to eliminate the survey for the second bridge, which is $5,000. So the net increase to the 2019 draft budget um, by virtue of, of those items is $9,369. Um, is there an agreement that the IT technician position should be added? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to see it done. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that we have to do that impacts across. Agreed. And, and it impacts every department yep. and every employee, so. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for the record, because we're all nodding our head, yes, it <laughs> needs to be said that the consensus by the committee here tonight is yes, add that position. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, what is in that next grouping that was agreed upon at the last me meeting, it, it bears uh, mentioning, is the add the one cent gas tax for a total of five cents to fund 43 street capital revenue. Um, but what we need to decide tonight are some additional positions, and that is adding the crew leader and maintenance worker um, to the general fund for streets. Those two workers would be assigned to uh, city forestry duties, allowing us to eliminate $100,000 annually in the budget for uh, tree trimming. Um, it, uh, there is an explanation by the street supervisor, Scott Haynes, that was included in the materials that were attached to the agenda. Um, right now, the, the streets department, they utilize an outside contractor almost completely for the forestry work that they do within the city. And because of that, um, Scott kind of waits until he has added up a number of different projects around town. So for expedience sake, he can call the contractor in once and reduce the mobilization and demobilization expenses associated with that. Having our at least two people dedicated in the city to doing this tree trimming allows us to be more responsive, immediately react to a situation that needs to be taken care of. In addition, um, during the off season, during the uh, leaf and brush season, as well as the winter season, it allows uh, those individuals to supplement our crews that are utilized for those purposes as well. 
Um, and then the other position is to add hours to the um, part-time employee in the HR department um, so that they can um, get ahead on some, some project as well. I don't know if everyone realizes, but the Human Resources Department does not have any uh, computer system associated with personnel. They uh, maintain their records in uh, Excel, and they utilize our um, accounting software for our payroll. And so one of the things that uh, the HR department is going to be looking at in the coming year is uh, comparing some software that they might utilize to uh, be more efficient and be able to track more things, be more strategic, see trends, um, and improve uh, the uh, or I should say reduce the potential for a human error to affect uh, thing, our operations negatively. So in order to do that, um, it would assist them to have the part-time employee at least be able to have five more hours per week. And as you can see, the impact to the budget is pretty insignificant. It's less than $10,000. Um, and then the last item that would need approval is that um, increase of the levy, which is simply attributable to the change in the EAV. So it doesn't result in any rate change, but it does result in a $140,000 increase. Um, the rate will stay at approximately um, 74 cents. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments on what we need to answer yes or no on there as far as adding the crew leader or the maintenance worker and or the increase in the HR position? Let's hit those three first. Alan? I, I'm in support of that. I believe that, you know, being able to have somebody on crew in town that can respond to those things and not have to go out to contract immediately after a storm unless it's something big um, that employee can also be used for other operations throughout the rest of the year, which we spend a lot of money on downtown. We spend a lot of money on a, a lot of other places in town that we have buildings, property we own, other things that we have, and that, that would fall under that category where I think it's better to spend that money in-house um, to be able to have the flexibility to get those things done when we need them done. Susan? I thought... One of the reasons that we started outsourcing is because we had had that accident internally, um, and so we started outsourcing so that we wouldn't have to worry about things like that. So now we're bringing it back in? Um, I believe that the, the injury occurred in the uh, brush removal, and we are still going to utilize a third-party contractor for the brush removal. Is that correct, Gary? That's correct. Yes. But, it, but isn't um, stump grinding and um, brush or tree trimming equally as dangerous? You're not sticking your hand into the, into the chipper all the time, I guess. Is what, is what okay. Is what, yeah, yeah. Chainsaw. it's a lot of going up in a yeah. bucket the, the, truck with it's a... Just, it kind of was one of those like weird trade-offs to me. Mm -hmm. So, okay, just wanted to check. Question. I mean, I'll, I'll say in general, Alderman Stark, that, that from probably beginning to end in, in all of our public works trades, there's an element of danger. Okay. And from the guys going in confined space to the guys working on our electric utility to the guys being out in traffic. So uh, I don't know that we're adding a particular level of, of danger by adding these positions. Okay. It just, it, I guess then the question I would have is why don't we bring our um, brush pickup back in-house? We don't have the people to do it. Now, okay. we'd, have to, we'd have to hire more people if you want to bring that back in-house. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mark? I guess in general, I'm okay with starting to add some more staff, but it just seems like, okay, we've, we've got this four or five positions and everybody just wants all of them right away. And we should, I think it'd be a little bit more cautious with how we do this. I think the, the challenge I have with adding too much is now we're adding all the pension liability onwards. And so this is it's a cost for a very long time, whereas obviously having contractors gives us that ability that that's not a liability that we have to pay for. So I want to be cautious about 
you know, going all in and all the positions that we're, we're looking for here mm -hmm. um, because we have a way to, to solve this problem. IT doesn't have a way right now to solve the problem of not having enough staff. Mm -hmm. The contractor stuff, um, and I'm talking about it enough, it just, it's not as available for the type of position that we have in IT. So I'm not comfortable with it right now. Did I see somebody else over here? No. I have, Susan? I have another general question about the funding source for this. So, you know, um, I watched the last budget meeting since I couldn't be here, and I was here the one before. One of the things that I'm very perplexed about is why we have this huge savings account called mm. reserves that we're not spending. And so when it comes to the budget, why are we not taking things out of the reserves that are one-time expenditures and, and spending that money down? I mean, why are we? Why do we have a savings account with the taxpayer's name on it? This does not make any sense to well, me. Well, you can see I, that, that, that four-year projection on the reserves, and it's, it's dwindling very fast over the next four years. Okay. And that's pr primarily and that's due to it. salary and, and pension increases, mm -hmm. um, and that's 70% yeah. of our budget. Yeah, no, I understand that. So, yeah. so if, we, if we utilize that, we shouldn't utilize our reserves to pay for ongoing expenses, as you say, well, a one-time right, expense. Exactly. It would be good. The unfortunate circumstance is that we see ourselves uh, it, within the next four to five years, falling below the level of our policy. Okay, I understand. How did the reserves get to the level that they are now, so that so that they don't keep creeping up every year? So, I mean, that's where what I don't exactly understand. I know that we had put money into things that were never funded, and so that money dumped into the reserves. I, I totally get that, mm -hmm. um, but you're saying that if we drew money out of the reserves now, there's no way that the money will ever come back. You know, I, I only can look at the last couple of years right. in, in determining how uh, we ended up with additional amounts mm -hmm. in, in the reserves, uh, and I really can't point to any one thing in particular. It's certainly something that as a board that you can make a decision and have that be part of your policy as well, to have a, a maximum number. Well, we, as, I mean, as, as I recall, the way we got up that high yeah. is that's just really been a, a policy decision based on the prior city councils and the prior city right. administrators that we wanted to exceed what is the norm. Um, right. And and we had good sales tax base, which has dropped off due to the recession. It's never right. regained back to where it was, which was a lot of the contributing factor to the to the uh, reserves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was just a, a good policy decision that prior city councils and administrators have have wish to proceed with and, and I think it was the right thing to do but that's how it got so high. I understand that and I understand that we have this savings account called reserve and so and we do have an ordinance that says that we have to have 90 days worth of reserves at, 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 but we right now have much more than 90 days worth of reserves so the only way it goes down is to spend it we don't dip into our reserves unless we, during this process, we say, okay, let's take that out of reserves. So why are we not saying let's take money out of reserves right now for some of the other expenditures that are not ongoing, like salary? This is where I don't understand how we're making our spending decisions. We talked about this last year at the same time. I know. And, and we do every year. And why didn't we fund those those well, uh, Peggy, if I remember right, Peggy, Peggy and Laura came to us about mid-year and said this is a decision, something that we talked about, and if we wanted to change our policy in the reserves and draw some of it down, we could do that. What did we want to do? And we decided to kind of leave things the way they were. But until we've been through a session or two with the state, I, right, I'm fine with leaving the reserves where they're at. Once we know with where we think that's going to be after a couple of sessions downstate. That was the other contributing I, factor, the LG. We, we don't know where that's going to go. I mean, is, if, we, yeah. if, we're, or if we're sitting here next year and we're half of what we have this year back from the state. How many years in a row really have nice we said have. that, though? Uh, mm. I mean, I think that that's what's kind of interesting is how many years have we said, ooh, we well, don't we want to touch the reserves. 
from the state. So that's a real concern. I know that, but if we always have that concern, that's a, I, I mean, it's in my mind, it's we've asked the taxpayers to give us money to fund a savings account that we're not spending. And I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that last year we increased the levy to pay for something that we already had money for. And so this year we're going, well, we don't want to spend this money because, well, what if? Well, okay. what if? So you don't like it, Marty? Um, <laughs> along those lines, um, we've had, and I think I said this last year when we were talking about it, we will usually come in here and say for the property taxes, are we either holding the line or are we going to increase it? Mm -hmm. We never, ever, ever talk about decreasing the property tax, ever. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna throw out kind of what you're saying, propose how do we decrease our property taxes for this year? I think that Part of the indecision over the past couple years, you can look to that and say, yeah, there was a little bit of unease. There's a little bit of unease and more and more was coming in. <clears throat> but it doesn't sit all by itself. We weren't going through that same unease. We are growing. We have retail coming in. We have manufacturing coming in. All of those things are increasing. All of those houses are going to be built within the next year. This year, as a policy decision, there is opportunity to use for this year some of those reserves for the one-time costs that I optimistically believe are going to be made up within the next year. That can be done, and I think it should be done for this year. Because of the fact of what we're sitting on, I think it's, it's part of the, the narrative of what I took away out of the home rule part of it. People said, be creative. And the part about being creative is, look what we're doing with kind of thinking some creative spreading the pain out facts or taxes. The only thing that we've never been able to do is give property tax relief. We've been able to say, here's a Band-Aid, we're not going to do it this year. But nobody talks about it. And we have an opportunity, since we're sitting on extra cash, that would put, yes, in a, a little bit of dent in this year, but I'm looking longer term for what those next four years are going to be, we're gonna be able to make it back up. Will, I, will you be able to make up a pension costs hmm. that increase 50% over the next five years? So, then, so can you tell the 2023 taxpayer that the additional 50 days of operating revenue will be part of that budget. So that also goes to why his point, why Mark's point is more, um, more uh, prudent, that maybe we need to wait. And maybe we look for those things that are constantly doing, or not constantly, that are maintaining the, um, the outsourcing of those things. We're not incurring those pension costs. We're not growing. Another thing that I would kind of challenge is since we are sitting on some extra funds, why don't we kick in a little bit more of those reserves into our pension funds? We know, it's been discussed before about the infrastructure gap that is out there. The larger gap is in pensions, and we're not doing anything more than, oh no, we are. We actually no, are. That's what Every I mean. Every year. We are. We are funding above the actuarial Correct. even more, but we still have a gap. Right. You know the more that you put in at an earlier date when it comes to retirement, the more that it's going to save you. So just like if you make an extra payment on your house, you're saving all that extra interest. Mm -hmm. Would it be something to look at? Instead of worrying about it, that money is going to have to be made up at some point. That pension gap, that even though we're extra funding, if we funded a little bit more now, 
that puts it the burden on later at a later date. And I will say the the precedent for what we're talking about was done. And it was done when we raised the property taxes. We made $150,000 in cuts. We raised the property taxes, the 600,000. But what did we also do? We also did the let's do the rainy day fund now instead of fishing out our power lines. We put is it 200, 225 into out of reserves for that very purpose. And if I if my memory serves me, our reserves were 130-ish. And the same concern that, oh, we're going to draw them down, we're going to draw them down. Within a year, we are 20 plus days more. So we didn't even go down. We went up 23 days. And, Realize and that's in a year where we lost Sam's Club. And, and there were many expenditures that we didn't make. And it's still gone up. But it's and it, still gone up because the sales tax, rem, the revenue remained flat where we expected it to decrease. And yet, what have we been able to do? We've been able to figure out some plans moving forward. We're, fit, we're putting more people back into positions that were needed. We're not making cuts. We are, and, but we're not fun. I, I was thinking you're not suggesting to fund positions with reserves. I'm correct. No, I, that, no, right? I said okay. we've got we've got three police cars that could be. We've got a community a development vehicle. vehicle that yep. could be. We could take an easy three days, and we're not even talking about a property tax increase anymore. We're talking about a property tax decrease. And what kind of narrative does that kind of start sending to the, the larger community as a whole? Other communities, Geneva <laughs> did do property tax decrease. So why aren't we considering it? I've considered raising the property taxes, but it doesn't make sense when you've got all these other things. That's why I proposed the one cent gas tax. It's not about being anti-taxation, mm -hmm. it's about wisely taxing so that you have a broader base of what's being spent out there. And the one thing that our residents have said over and over and over and over again is property tax decrease. We have the ability to potentially do that. And all I'm asking for is serious consideration of it. It is the third lowest property tax. It is. And it's not close to second. But I would, I mean, I would rather be closer to second than fourth. Who are the ones that reduce their property taxes? Yeah. Wasn't it Geneva last year? Yeah, significantly last yeah. year. Yeah. Mm. I'll have to check that. I don't they may have to, they may have to increase it this year from. That, that would be my concern. I mean, we've heard all the reasons in the world why we need to be thinking of our future as far as infrastructure and road improvements and everything. But Elliot? Yeah. It, 156 days in reserves when our level is 90. I get the five year outlook. I support looking out five years even more if we can reliably look at that. Um, but, I'm, but I am uncomfortable with the fact that we have almost twice as much as is needed in reserves. Mm -hmm. um, so when I see 156 days and, and knowing that yes, there are a lot of one time expenditures that we could be doing or I like Marty's idea about let's give an injection to the pension because that will play dividends down the line. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that there is something to be played there and, and at least looked at and considered, especially if on the single year you have a, what was a $1.2 <clears throat> million dollar surplus on a year that we lost Sam's Club. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that that's you know, something to just balk at and throw out the window. Obviously, it was a huge hurdle. We all, we all dealt with that in stride over the past year. Um, but what year hasn't had hurdles? And, and yet we saw a strong end of year with the, with the reserves that we have and the surplus that we had. Um, I am not proposing to fund salaried, pensioned positions with reserves. I am not. But exchanging some things, looking at some other angles here, the one cent gas tax, I agree. I, I said last time we met that I, I could support that. That's not a property tax. Um, but I think we can do our due diligence with the portion of the property tax bill that is in our control. 
Uh, I would suggest that, and, and the city council has agreed as part of its strategic action plan, that it does not have a solid plan for uh, sufficiently funding its infrastructure. And I think that that would be a bigger problem to address than having reserves that are too healthy this year with them projected to be under the policy within three years time. 2022 is when it falls below the policy by 11 days. But I, I, guess what, I guess one of the things that I'd like to know too is if we do fund that pension ahead of time, how does that affect that number? Because it's five years out. Yeah, right. you'd have to, I think we'd have to get Peggy involved. Yeah, yeah you, you, have, to, you yep. have to run some numbers. Yep. And, and one of the things that I would, I'd also like to do, and I know she kind of took this off the table, and, and maybe this isn't something we have through this budget cycle. Maybe, maybe it's a budget amendment we make during the, during the year if we feel mm -hmm. comfortable with it. But getting some help for Peggy, um, you know, she does this stuff with one hand tied behind her back, basically, right, and does a phenomenal job regardless. And if, we, if we're able to free her hands up to analyze more, in it, which she does a great job of, but if she had more time to do that, holy cow, you know, we'd be squeezing lots of dollars out. And, and I, I, I have that comfort level with her because she's phenomenal. But I think that's something we need to think about too. It's, it's not unlike the computer, you know, or the, you know, our computer sciences person. I mean, that's, that, she touches everything. I hear you, but we, you know? we can't really have both. We are, the, the staff is charged with um, providing you with a balanced budget. Right. And therefore, we can only project revenues based on the anticipated, um, exp you know, the expenses and the revenues mm -hmm. have to come out to a zero sum sure. yeah. every year. I think it's one of those things, I'd like to have it on the radar screen. You know, because I, I mean, when I hear it, when, when it's something that Peggy wants, who is, she throws nickels around like manhole covers. So I agree. When, when it's something, when I hear her say that, I take it seriously. I so. do too. And so I, you'll definitely see that as a proposal in next year's budget. But I, I have to tell you, talk of uh, reducing our reserves when they'll be so depleted in such a short period of time, it's not something I would feel safe recommending. Ellen? If, I think we need to step back here, and I wish Peggy was here because I know she could figure this out quicker than I sat here and tried to figure it out. There's reasons why we have 150,000 or 150 days worth of reserves. Part of them is two trucks we talked about tonight, we didn't pay for. Those were in last year's budgets. Mm -hmm. That money was in the budget from last year. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reserves. That's 200 grand. Okay. We have other things that we put off. We didn't hire a policeman. We didn't hire. Um, the um, community, for, development. community development. You add those two hundred thousand dollars or ninety five thousand dollars a piece, whatever the actual numbers are, that starts to add up. And that, to me, says the one hundred and fifty five number of reserve days is not true, is not reality when we get to next year. Dan, because that's money that we had already planned to spend, so that kind of has inflated our numbers yes Dan so I'm Marty I'm, I'm generally on board I, I like the idea my concern is this it does make 2019's budget discussions that much harder um, in our strategic plan that we just went over we had all these different projects we want to do my question is, is if we do take this fairly symbolic gesture telling the community that we're going to spend down some reserves we, during 2019, have to have that serious discussion on streets, sidewalks, storm sewer, riverbank stabilization, a bridge fund, and we need to start socking money away for each of these projects. We just identified, what, $70 million in, in projects that we could do if we wanted to start bombing on those today. Um, what, where are we going to be a year from, from today? I mean, I'm, I'm on board. I like it. I do. How do we, how do we tell our neighbors that we're not being dis we're not not being disingenuous. We're we're legitimately um, taking a breather and trying to help them out this year. How do I how do I sell that to my neighbor? So having that conversation is what we should be doing no matter what. And if you step back and think, we've been kind of doing a hold the own and 
it's been working out. We kind of have to trust that what we've been doing is paying dividends because all those things that we're talking about, this budget this year isn't doing those things that's not funding the, the having the discussions next year where we're just throwing something that we're not even doing. The planning is already in this year's budget and we're still able to do it. To your point, Alan, about the, the, the total amount that we're asking for, whether or not we spent it this year or that last year, it's in the total amount this year it's counted for. And we still have 155 days. It's not saying the, the budget is $137 million and those extra things we're taking out of the budget, we still pass that budget at 137, we still have 155. Had those other days been spent, or had those been spent last year, then what would, would the budget have been less this year? Do we have to consider this as a budget amendment, or, because my fear is we present this to Peggy and she looks at this, part of me is like, if she was here today, she'd be like, she'd be horrified. No, y'all can't do any of this. <laughs> you, you can't, you can't. She really would be can, upset looking at the five-year plan for, for sure. reserves. Can well, we address this as a budget amendment later in the year and say, you know what, we are as a council comfortable putting in a couple, two, three days worth of reserves. We'd like to spend that. Um, do we do it as a budget amendment instead? This is where I say, go back yeah. to what we said just we had this same discussion this isn't out of precedent at all we did it last year when we funded more out of the reserves for the storm for the um the river bank stabilization we had the same discussion and there was the initial scared to spend that money because this is where it scares me at times when we get the money in, all of a sudden we turn into the miserly old widow that we can't open the purse because now it's our money. But then we say, can you kick in a little bit more? But what about what we, I send the kids to go to the grocery store. I was talking with Susan about this one. I send them with a $5 bill to go get milk and, and it's not normally 350, it's 95 cents. Well, do they keep the extra four dollars and go now i'm going to go get another gallon of milk give me another five you don't do that it's the same basic principle we collected too much money because we have a surplus that's a good thing because that's wise thinking that we're always trying to do that we're not saying if we draw down three days or four days that all of a sudden we're under the the cap we would have four years to try to make up those other ones. And if we can't make up four years, we're not living on a shoestring. That but in four years, we're not four. making up four days. We're making up 80. But we're not spending out of that. Can I, uh, w Wendy, can I put you on the spot for a minute if you want to grab the mic? Um, I'm just curious because I know one of the concerns is the ongoing cost of adding new employees. Um, and I don't know if you know off the top of your head or if you could guess, but just like our infrastructure aging, our employees are aging. So a uh, concern would be, you know, once we add somebody, how do we take that away if we come into a bad year or two? Over the next few years, how many employees do we have that may be retiring that we could then decide okay they've retired we run into a couple bad years here we're not going to replace these people do you have any idea so when you look at just purely going off of age we have about um, a quarter of our employee population that is nearing within the last with the next five years whether or not they choose to whether they choose to work longer than what they say but based on their availability to have access to the retirement, about a quarter of our employees. So if you look at our full-time um, work, even if you just do basic around 200 employees, um, about, what's a quarter? 50. Yeah, about 50 employees at any so, one time. So that is one way that if we do add employees now and we run into a couple bad years 
two, three years, four years, five years from now, we could be looking at that opportunity to not replace if the funds aren't there to support it. Correct. Yes. And just Dave, just a simple logistics, you have several people that are leaving, they're probably either capped out or at the higher end of their salary range. Mm -hmm. The replacements are going to be much lower. That's why the, the pension discussion is the larger discussion of it. Okay. Because it's not really hiring new employees because you're not really having somebody leave at $120,000 and replacing that person with 115. dollars Agree. I'm just trying so, to get, I'm really, Marty, I'm just trying to get, you know, we've got a yep. few yellow spots here, and I have no problem with having this discussion, but we've got a few yellow spots and we need a few more of them filled in here, and I, I'm, you know, the discussion about budget and, and, and reserves and everything else, I think the reserves obviously has to wait until Peggy's back right. in the room to have this discussion, but as far as adding crew leaders and maintenance worker, a crew leader and maintenance worker, I would really like to try to narrow that conversation down to a yes or a no on that. I mean, I certainly, I don't know how many other aldermen sitting here tonight have taken the opportunity to talk to some of our department heads when they're asking for something, to sit and have a conversation with them. As you know, when they present the budget, it's very broad. Very, mm -hmm. very. It's not. It's not like sitting down and having a conversation and saying, "Tell me why you need this guy." I have. So I'm certainly supporting. I mean, Scott's been asking for this for years. Gary's been asking for this for years, and you know, hey, I'm sorry, we just can't do it. It's time. It's time that we give them what they need to give the residents what they are asking for. So I'm certainly supportive of this crew leader and this maintenance worker. Quick question for you. So one of the things, you know, when I look at, at this, you know, we're able to offset some of that by eliminating a contract for $100,000, right? And, and so my, my, you know, I, but that doesn't have pension implications like, uh, like Mark had mentioned, but my my other question is: I know that theoretically, within the the comments that we got, that we're able to re retask them in other areas, whether it's leaf pickup or or, or whatever, what have you. Is there a um, can, can we assign a dollar savings or some some sort of some sort of you know uh, dollar to that as well? To be able to reuse those people in different areas, whether it's reflecting efficiencies or, um, you know, snow plowing or or whatever. And I guess that's my, my question: Are we able to, you know, take that hundred thousand dollars and in, you know add to that in terms of savings by using retasking them in other areas? So, like specifically, leaf collection, it's mm -hmm. not it's not going to be. Um, great dollars like we hire this year on average four temporary staff well we're paying a staffing agency you know twelve dollars an hour right for 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 temporary staff so we we, we gain back two of those positions at twelve dollars an hour that's not a lot of money um, snow plowing is a little different story in that snow plowing leads to efficiencies and and, and, and um, operation um, and availability of personnel um, it's harder to put a dollar value on that though more, more that's more quantitative and, and the service aspect of what you actually see out there those are two big ones that, that yeah no, I, I, it's that's tough it's a gray area I, I get it but Dave when there was also um, the the budget calls for what is it ninety two thousand dollars every year for the for the subsidization subsidizing the the brush pickup if we remove that that's a year over year out of the budget that goes a long way to those positions that on, that funds mm -hmm. that funds one position and that's doing nothing but not subsidizing something that should be on a per fee only it by itself that makes sense because it does the, although if there is one fee that the city receives the most complaints about it's the brush pickup then we've not combined and intermingled property taxes subsidizing a fee for a brush pickup then you can have the honest to goodness 
transparent conversation of here is the true cost of brush pickup residents. Do you want to keep it or not? Mm -hmm. And if the community does not want to, then it'll go away. And it do, then it will have no budget impact because then it wouldn't just automatically free up the money. I think if you separate that, that gets one of the positions that's, that we've been talking about and it does so that you now have, you fully funded the brush pickup, here's your true cost. Make your decision public. Well, we've asked staff to give us a true cost after this year's going out for bid and, and this leaf pickup mm -hmm. this season. So we'll have that, but I don't think we ought to consider that in this year's budget. Well, and that's where I'm just saying for that, that's, that's in here if we want to take it out for this year and raise it for raise the fee for this year knowing that it would be that amount. It frees that up. And if it comes in that we put it out to bid and it comes in lower, well, then it comes in lower and the fees would go down. That would be an ultimate win-win. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody else have any other comment? Uh, you know, we, we've got these yellow boxes here we got to fill in. <laughs> Mark. Just really quick, I don't want to continue to discuss, I'm going to anyway. I don't want to continue <laughs> to discuss the reserves, but I was just glancing back at 2015, 2016, 2017, and never in any of those did we predict that we were going to be increasing our reserves. And yet every year we keep on increasing our reserves. So we were projected, I think 2015, it was, um, we were supposed to be at 112 days in 2018, actually 92 in 2019. Um, the 2018 budget had us at 123 days in 2019. So We've done a really good job, and I know every time I sat here for the last year plus and somebody came up, hey, we saved $200,000 on this contract. We saved $200,000 on this contract. We tend to save a lot of money. So just keep that in mind is that our budget, as good as it is, we, we over budget and we underspend. And you look, we've, over the last three years, we're $3 million in surplus. So. But our city's falling yeah, apart. Yeah, and I. I and I would like to point out that this year is an anomaly when we knew that we were going to be potentially missing almost a million dollars in revenue. I mean, I, I, I get all of the arguments, but I just look at the, the, the they're asking on the street, street division, you know, we're going to be repairing streets. We're going to spend $1.3 million repairing streets, and we have $1.5 million. And in five years, we're going to have to spend $11 million to maintain our roads, and we have no money. Our budget is shot. So, I mean, <laughs> money is gone. We, we're not spending it, so our streets right. are falling apart. We've had people in here two years ago from, from Connecticut when we were talking about different things, and they were saying, you know, you got to do your infrastructure. We haven't done our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Gary and the street crews are putting things together with scotch tape, in essence. I mean, we give them nothing to work with. If we're going to spend money, we need to do it on infrastructure. I, I can't agree, and it doesn't matter what I say, I guess, but I can't agree giving a tax cut. I'm sorry, because you never get it back. And, and, I'm all, and I pay the taxes, too. And so the people want a nice town to live in, and that's what we're working on giving it to them. We work very hard, all of us, all the time, trying to maintain that EAV, and we do a good job of it. And so now to just, because we're doing well, I mean, if we just can't start just saying, well, let's give it back, because some, a handful of people in our community had this grand idea, this referendum about home rule. Well, they were misinformed, and I'm sick of it. And they were misinformed. And so that's behind us. I'm not going to kowtow to that handful of people now because of their misinformation and half-truths. And so I just think we need to maintain our city. And I don't mean to, I must be tired. But, <laughs> but we, we need to maintain our city, and we've not been doing that. And that's where our money should be going. Sorry for the long speech. <laughs> it's not a, quite short, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Susan? I think what Mike is saying is right on point. The thing is, is that we, we have these plans, 
Okay, so let's start putting them into action. Let's not just sit on that money and say, well, we need to keep it just in case. Let's start spending it. Because otherwise, I don't feel that we're being good stewards of the taxpayers' money. We've taken it from them. Now let's spend it on something that they need. So whether it's roads or streets or infrastructure, storm yeah. sewers, let's spend it. That's the bottom line in it's, terms of what I think. It's getting spent. By the year 2023, it's down how many millions Gone. of dollars? And how many years have we been saying that we're going to spend through our reserves right. and not have anything left? I mean, I can come up with a doomsday scenario for everything. I mean, the town could implode next year, and we would have nothing left either. But it hasn't happened. And so based on our track record, I want to believe that it's not going to happen. The reserves are also a, are also a catch-all. It's a sludge that happens. So yeah. we, we've said no to a bunch of things. So that's kind of unfair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Good but uh, but even when we have said yes, it hasn't drawn down the reserves that much. I mean, before we've ever drawn down the reserves by a penny, we all sit around and hand ring for hours about, oh, we shouldn't draw down those reserves. Okay, they're 100 days, they're 120 days, they're even more days. Better not draw down those reserves. But if we draw them down too much, how are we going to tell our neighbors, oh, yeah, we need to increase your taxes by 10 cents every year for the next five years to pay for a bunch of things? That's going to suck. I want to be careful. Well, you won't be on the council in 2020. Dave, no, I'm you're kidding. Lame. You're lame. You're lame, <laughs> I'm Doc, kidding. So. That was, we'll I here. was kidding. So, so fine. Okay, let, right. let's, let's talk about other ways then that don't affect property taxes, right, but allow us to, to you know, get the money that is needed in order to support the staff requests. Um, you know, a couple of things that, again, I'm not saying any one of these things in and of itself is going to suddenly add and inject a million dollars that gets us all these staff positions that we're looking for. But when I look on the budget lines and I see gaming brings in roughly thirty-five to forty-five thousand dollars, is there room that we could increase that particular tax that might bring in more revenue? Parking tickets. How much time is a already low manned police staff spending on overnight parking tickets? Could we look at some kind of overnight parking program, a quarterly pass, something? We actually yeah, do options? have an overnight yeah. parking pass in the downtown area, but we don't have What it about residential? Res we have a number of, we've debated here at City Council allowing overnight parking and the decision was that there are too many detrimental factors. They decided not to implement downtown. Or, uh, I'm, I'm open to overnight. ideas. I'm throwing out things that I see in here that there's got to be some other way other than property tax as the fallback each and every time this conversation comes up. We could triple the gaming tax and then we'd have 100000 as opposed to 30 though. So that's a drop in the bucket. And, and yet we're the I, rates I remaining saying, the same. the principle of what I'm talking about. I get it, but it's probably going to have to come. For, it, 10 cents on property tax is probably where it's going to have to come from. Well, we're you know, really, interested. guys, I mean, any, any, all these ideas are all great ideas, but we don't have to have the discussion just in November. Right. We should be having these discussions yeah. throughout, throughout the, the year. year. We have to have it next month. Right. We have to have it next month because we told our strategic plan we were going to do it. We have to. Oh, that's well, it's a little, actually, the public for hearing on the budget is Tuesday. What I mean is for next year. Yeah. We need to see what the 2019 budget looks like if we're going to address any, any of these infrastructures that are that are falling apart. Right. So for those ideas, I mean, those are great ideas. Right? For those ideas, mm -hmm. don't wait until we have a four-hour-long discussion. <laughs> don't go anywhere with it. You got an idea like that, send an email on off to Laura mm -hmm. and or Peggy and say, hey, I got this idea. What would it do if we did this? And you'll get your answer, mm -hmm. and it can then come to the committee and, 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 you know, for the conversation of, hey, I thought about doing this. They've looked into it, and this is what it would do for us. What do you guys think? And then we have the discussion about whether or not we change the overnight parking in the residential area because it would increase our revenue X amount of dollars, you know. So let's start those conversations, but let's start them ahead of time. Earlier, yeah. I think we're losing sight of what we've been doing in the past four, five, six years, though, which has been prioritizing, setting out projects, and getting them done. I don't think that our streets are falling apart because we know that they've got a maintenance program for the streets. It's underfunded. No, it's underfunded, underfunded by a million dollars. Okay. to Gary when he no, speaks to him in the year. I'm not saying that I'm not 
disagreeing with you that it's underfunded. Mm. But we could do all these things and try to find the funding for it tomorrow. And as Gary has said time and time again, we don't have enough people to do all of those things either. So we can't say that all of the, the, the streets and everything, the underfunding for that and the collapse of that is going to go away tomorrow. This has been 50 years of America not funding it correctly. We have been doing the right thing with trying to figure out how much we can do every year and we've not been kicking the can down the road. We've been saying, here's a project that we need to do. Here's a project that we need to do. The stormwater, you, the, the sewer separation, that was had been talked about for years. We decided, starting in 2015, that we're just going to go ahead and do it. We went and go ahead. We went ahead and raised the property taxes for a specific reason. We went out and got funding for it. We went out and got loans for it, and we did it. I don't think we're sitting back on our laurels. I think we need to look and really say, wait, we have been doing stuff, but we can't do it all at once. And as frustrating as that is, you just have to accept the fact that America's infrastructure is crap for the long future because it hasn't been able to. It has been improper planning with doing more roads and more expansion and more spread and all of the roads that come with that, that 25 years later, without plans, are now coming due. And that's what happened. 25 years ago, when we blew up, there was no long-term plan then. So we're trying to figure out the plans that started way before our... Mm -hmm. And that's something that we do know is uh, from our actuarials that look at our pension plans, we pretty much do know how those costs increase over the near term. And so I, what Peggy's looking at in terms of that expenditure line is primarily increases in salaries and pension contributions associated with that. So uh, that savings that we have built up there today is our safety and security against what will surely occur right. with regard to pensions. And I look at those savings spent over the next five years that's in that plan, that that's what pays for car, um, fire trucks, that's what pays for squad cars, that's what pays for dump trucks, that's what pays for equipment, and then the money that we raise out of everything else gets spent on pensions. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got a plan in front of us presented by staff and that plan includes which we need to say yes or no to it includes adding a crew leader because they've got a plan for maintenance of our streets so that includes adding a crew leader and and a maintenance worker then <clears throat> just have a vote and i was just going to get to that mike thank you and so I'm going to ask if we could take a vote on whether or not we're willing to add that crew leader and maintenance worker to this year's budget. So let's, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Aye. Aye. How many, let's, let's see, let's do a raise of hands. Yeah. Let's do a raise of hands for ayes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven ayes. How many nays? One, two, three, four, five nays. All right, so we're adding a crew leader and a, and a maintenance worker to this year's budget. So now the next question is the add five year five hours for the work week um, for the HR position for nine thousand nine hundred and forty dollars. How many people are in favor of that? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven. Everybody's in favor of that. All right, so now we're going to go on to the increase in the levy for a change in the EA. EAV with the no no rate change and that is recommended for the 2019 levy. So that'd be $140,000 increase to is due to the new construction rate, which will stay at seven. It'll stay at 0.743 cents. So how many people are in favor of leaving that levy just the way it is? One, two, three, four, five, six, and the no's are. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Mayor? <laughs> Might as well give us an answer before we get to City Council. Well, to make sure I'm voting the right way. Uh, how did you phrase that question again? I'm <laughs> Okay, yes, st staff, st staff is looking for an answer, yes or no, to... Uh, to uh, keep the rate the same. To keep the rate the same. Yes. You're a yes. Okay. So now I guess we could we've got the yellows all filled in, but if we want to continue the discussion about <coughs> reserves, we certainly can. Is there anything else with the budget that you want to talk about right now? No. I mean if we want to have the discussion about reserves and take some money out of reserves to pay for something, that'll affect this year's budget, but I, I you know, maybe no. maybe we should have that discussion and maybe the when it comes time to pay for trucks or something that could come out of reserves and that money could go into the pension. But let's get Peggy involved on that. Yeah. Right. And, and I'd like to know the the reality of is that inflation in the, the days of reserves, is that due to all the money we didn't spend on stuff last mm -hmm. year? Right. And is that why it fluctuates back and forth? Because then that makes sense as to why that money is there and why there's the, all those extra days. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that goes to kind of what Mark said. If you, you can't just look at this past year. Mm -hmm. We've always predicted that it's going to go down right. next year, and it never does. It, and you keep going back and back. So that's where it's having the larger discussion about what are we going to do. We, we always say it's going to be 90 days. So when it gets to 91 days, what do we do with that day? We don't have any plan for it, and then we get scared to spend it because we always think something's going to happen. And that's where we have to get comfortable with the same sort of comfortableness that we have with spending reserves should be just the same sort of comfortableness that when we consider raising property taxes. You know, I look at it a little bit. We always refer to our own personal household expenses, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got a savings account. And I've got a savings account because I want to feel good that I've got a savings account in case something happens. And when something doesn't happen, that's great. It just keeps building and it keeps building. One day I'll die and it'll get handed down to my gener the generation below me. And that's what I feel like with the city council. It just, it's there, it's there. If it doesn't get spent, that's great. The next city council has it and they can be sure that they've got all the expenses taken care of. The only difference with that is, is the savings account is ours that's growing, but our kids are saying, no, we, we, need, some, we need some of that money kind of back because we need some things for ourselves. And that's what we don't do. We don't consider the kids about giving some of that money back. That's a bad analogy, Jay. Yeah, no, it's a bad <laughs> analogy. Let's just say that, and I'll speak, for the, I'll speak for myself, and you can all nod if you agree with me. I don't believe the reserves is my money. Oh, okay. I, I believe that belongs to the, to the people, Agreed. but we are Agreed. entrusted and taxed, or tasked, I should say, with their trust to spend it wisely. Mm -hmm. um, I've got okay. an idea. That $300,000 check that's coming to us in March, let's put that to pension. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right For the general contractor. <laughs> How yep. Like to pay off the EPA loans? I'm fine with that, too. Mm -hmm. All right, Laura, okay. do we have anything else with the budget? Nope, that's it. Yeah. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. He was up and uh, yeah, just Mark. Every again, going back and looking at other budgets, we tend to project flat revenues year over year, and yet our revenues are increasing year over year. If you look at look at the budget, so that's why we keep on saying that the reserves are going to disappear, is because we say that in 2023 we're going to be at 27,845. And if you go back two years ago in this year we were going to be at 27528 but we're kind of in that um, but in general bad example but in general <laughs> if you look at it if you go back even further we have 2019 being at 25000 or 25 million so we're a couple million over that so that's one of the reasons that the reserves look bad is because we say that we're not going to we're not going to get a raise but we're naturally going to get a raise by our EAV going up so we have to and we've been projecting that. I mean, we've got a giant building going over here, whether you like it or not. 400 homes being built. You RCA. guys got to remember, I, I, homes do not pay yeah, for themselves. They do not pay for themselves. They cost they us money. Demand services and infrastructure. That money is going to be tied up for the next 
26 years. <laughs> Residents that are coming and paying taxes as well. I mean, there's Correct. stuff. Correct. So there'll there'll be sales, sales taxes tax increased. Everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's Absolutely. Right. That, that's, the, that's the beauty of that. That's right. But the homes themselves cost, I mean. We have it, industrial going. We right. have restaurants going. We have a lot of stuff that's coming. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm more in favor of saying, okay, hold off because don't spend just because we think we have it now. Spend when we actually do have it. And so we have a little bit of money, so let's spend out of reserves and then add some more um, positions in a couple years when, yep, we're where we thought we were and our reserves are exactly the way they were two years ago. Do it that way. Right. But our industrials, too, is coming because of some pretty creative financing by Peggy and Gary, the heads of the electric department, because industrial is not coming for our electric utility, and, and, and so we have to give back to people to get them here. It, and we're, still the, making, cool. we're still making money off of it. It's, uh, we're not losing uh, money by bringing them in. Uh, we already well, went through that. We're not losing money by bringing the, the them in. The city's not losing money. The, the general fund isn't, but I would think, the, I would think our uh, electric utility fund, I don't know. Not the way it was described no. to us, no. 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 We're not losing money. We're still making money on that. Right. So we're not giving things away. We're not making as much as we could have, but we would have made zero if we hadn't done anything. Right. Well, we're still Nick, losing, but it's a million a, a year. Uh, anecdotal uh, observation, I guess. In my short six years here, um, <laughs> I've always appreciated because of the situation we're in. Peggy is ultra conservative, mm -hmm. and every year we've had reasons to be, um, and. Mark just supported it and proves that we are conservative in our predictions and whatnot, and it's a great thing. I think this is the first year in my tenure that with 155 reserves and all this growth that we can afford to be a little optimistic. <laughs> um, before this, we've always been scared. So it, we're in a good position, and I would feel comfortable taking a few days off the reserves. Why don't we... I just leaned over to Laura and I said, "What do you think about having a good conversation in the end, of, at, towards the end of January, about our reserves, mm -hmm. our policy on reserves, and meeting. what we could be mm -hmm. use our our, mm -hmm. our reserves for?" So we'll do that at the end of January. Yes. So we'll talk to Peggy and be prepared for that, and we'll have that discussion. The point you were making about the homes costing us are exactly why our infrastructure has been completely underfunded. That's why with One North Washington, we are creating housing and people without adding to the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference. And right. that's why that's why I supported initially why that was going in. Mm -hmm. That goes to the whole point about when we're talking about funding these or allowing these developments to come in, what's the long-term strategy for those? You know you've bought a few years because you're going to give 10, 15, 20 years of good roads in those neighborhoods. But after that, then it's on us. So maybe we should have been kicking in, having the developer kick in more on that initially. But then we'd have to sit on that reserves for a while to be able to speak. No, because then you put that stuff, <laughs> you, put, Too soon. you put that stuff where it's supposed to be. You we've all else. We've all learned because we're in the mess we're in because people took money in. We're not in a mess. No, 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 not <laughs> us. I'm talking about the entire country the national, and the national. the national, the state, because they took the money in and they didn't just lock it up. They spent it on other things for what it was in uh, not intended to do. We've been doing those things well. That's why all of those things work out rather well for us. But at some point, we've got to figure out that balance, too. It, like I said last time, that's where it all comes down to the balance, is listening to what else people are saying right here and now. The five-year is good for getting an idea of what's going on. But if you've a little undercut the confidence of what you're dealing with today, you've got to look to the past. You've got to look to the future. But you also have to remember that we're living in the, the present day and how those things affect the, con the economics is consumer confidence. Everybody knows that. And if you're happy, you want to go out and spend more money. And it's all government 
economics is all perception, and the more people are happy about things, the more they're willing to spend and feel freer. If the conversation is always, oh my God, the city's overtaxing us, or we're being, we're being taxed out of our homes, well, that's, that's not true, because when you look at it, boil it down, you can show why it's not. But it goes to perception is reality, perception is reality. Over and over we say that. And that's where I'm saying for this year, let's look at the perception that we can create that might actually create something bigger in the long run. Dave, I have a question. Mike. Oh, Mike, sorry, I didn't see you I'd like to waving. put some two cents into this. Uh, we've had the same conversation about the reserves since I've been an alderman. Uh, I think we're in a better position today, three and a half years later, than we were three and a half years ago. We've added seven people to our staff. We've done major projects. So I think we're going in the right direction. I'm worried about that pension debt. You said there's going to be a 50% increase. I don't know. I, I just have a hard time. I think we should wait a little bit longer on the crew leader and, and street person. Uh, see what pans out. I think we're going to be in a better position. Let's see what kind of revenues come in. Susan, you have something else? I did. Um, you know, it, we touched on it a little. We had a little discussion about the, the true cost of brush pickup. And as Laura said, it's one of the things that um, utility building gets the most complaints about. Would it hurt to put that out as an advisory referendum on the April ballot to say, should we, the city of Batavia continue to have brush pickup, yes, or leaf pickup, whatever we want to call it, however we word that, yes or no? Yes, yeah, should we cease? Um, <laughs> Our question is a different way we can write And the only reason I ask is because I, I agree, based on social media, more people complain that they live in apartments, live in townhouses, live in areas where they have no need for it, and yet they're paying for it. And so, uh, you know, if I can, you know, my husband proved the, ex the experiment this year that you can mulch them just as easily as you can rake them even more easily. So, you know, I'm kind of like, should we put that out to the taxpayers? Because I've never felt comfortable that the city subsidizes a certain amount of that. I've never liked it in all the years we've done it. And we've never wanted to raise it to the true cost because it was putting too much burden on the, the ratepayers. So do they really want it? That's the million dollar question. And I don't think an advisory referendum would be the wrong thing to do. I'm not so sure I would agree with you because I don't think that the people that would vote for or against it would be voting, understanding the whole impact of what they're voting on. I can never, I'll never forget Bill McGrath when we had the conversation about even starting this whole thing, um, talked about the quality of life that we all expect. Okay. So maybe, maybe, People don't think we should impose this tax on everybody, but if we don't impose this tax on everybody, then are any of the leaves going to get picked up? And are there just going to be piles up in front of everybody's houses for who knows how long because people think they're going to get picked up, but they're not going to get picked up, or they're going to be blown around and people, I mean, so it, it's, it's, it's just like why, why do we only pick up the brush so many times a year, or why do we pick up the brush so many times a year? Because we want to offer this quality of life to people where we don't have tree limbs just laying in people's yards and they don't have any way of getting rid of them because they can't afford to hire a tree service to come out and pick up these trees that fall down in their yard during a little bit of a windstorm. So that's why we offer the tree, you know, the, the brush pickup because of that kind of reason. And the leaf is the same reason. It's a I hate to say quality of life because that's a very generic term, mm -hmm. but it's a quality of life. It's mm -hmm. it's it's why do we pick up trash, you know? Same reason. But you pay for your trash to pick up. Um, it, the city doesn't subsidize advance. Um, so but it's the same thing as why do we pay for the police? Why do we have police? It's a quality of life issue. Oh, no, I totally get it. I totally get it, but I think that so I don't if we're going to offer that service, we should have the taxpayers pay for the true cost. Can I uh, you'd have to pass uh, a, an ordinance to have the referendum on the ballot uh, at your meeting on December 3rd. I, I, Laura, how much does that cost, the city? Which, the uh, brush pickup or the no, leaf the, pickup? The advisory referendum. The advisory referendum. It doesn't, really. Okay. It's just writing up an ordinance. You guys pass it, and we give it to the county to put on the ballot. 
but the risk is that people think that they're answering whether they want to be charged for a service, and they just say, if it's a charge for a service, I don't want it. Brexit. One word, Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if, what did you say the cost was, Marty? $90,000? <clears> as far as what we're subsidizing? Yes. Yeah. That's the last part of what we're subsidizing. Yeah. Right. Which is the about the equivalent of one of Scott Haynes's guys. So do you get Scott Haynes's guy? Or do you subsidize the people um, br brush pickup? This is the million dollar question to me. I don't understand why it's, we why it's still being it's still being paid. Yeah, the ninety thousand dollar question. It's still being paid either way. It's just one is fully funded all by itself mm -hmm. right. and the other one is not. It just it just goes to transparency because What's we don't that? with the difference with police, we're not we're not charging a fee for every time a police officer comes out to your place and then funding the majority of operations with pay with property tax. Mm -hmm. You're not doing that. So that's not really the same analogy. Right, this so is, is that one guy this is, is that one guy it, we hire pick up all the it, it, not everybody it, uses the service and they get problem. charged anyway. Right. But mm -hmm. you're getting charged either way on those things. And maybe the, the only thing we're saying for the police so officer too. Separate. Same yeah, thing. Maybe the discussion on the leaf pickup ought to be more so should we see if utility billing has got a way to Put it only on households, not apartments. <laughs> Gary, automatically. I believe that's already, already the case. Yeah, we already do. So, I we so did if, you're, nope. yeah, if you're if you're living in an apartment or a townhouse and you don't actually receive brush collection, you don't pay the fee. Right. Oh. So there goes that. Yeah. The pro the single property owner pays the the fee. Whether feel, they utilize the service or not, uh, and we have a tremendous amount of people who already are angry that they pay for the service and they don't use it. Well, so I guess the, the question is then, Gary or Laura, if if I own a rental property, a two flat in the on Prairie Street, mm -hmm. as the property owner, do I pay for that? Do I pay for brush pickup? I believe even that would be yes, right? That's how you have it set up with your tenant. Yeah. Yeah. Tenant yeah. Okay, the but bill. they're still being so whoever's paying the utility okay. bill. So what you're saying is the apartment complexes don't pay for large complexes, townhomes. Okay. Rent. Well, that, but you do. Okay. Right, and he, you live in a townhouse. Okay, so that's why I, you don't. It's not like you can opt out of the service. You're paying for it whether you get it or not. So I, I don't know. I just have, we've talked about this for years. Lisa Clark was on the council and we talked about should we pass along the true cost of this to the taxpayers and it was always, the answer was no. All right, well, we've already said that staff is gonna get us what the true cost is so we can have this discussion then. Next year. In December or November? No, it'll be. Oh, oh, I won't be here. Then. It'll be probably <laughs> February. <laughs> okay. Should I ask if there's anything else, or should we just go on to the next item? <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on to the next item, project status. Well, this is one of those uh, Committee of the Whole meetings where I've talked about all my projects yesterday at the uh, City Council meeting, but maybe an update on the One Washington Place project since we did receive the um, comments back from the developer's lender on the environmental indemnification agreement, um, and they accepted most of the um, changes that the city recommended to that agreement, so that that looks to be um, in a, a, a format that we could present to you soon, but we would also like to present that with um, uh, a plan for the remediation of that site, the cost of the remediation for that site, and then any um, effects that uh, the remediation plan would have on the uh, redevelopment agreement. So we kind of want to just put that forth to you all at once so that you can decide exactly how to proceed on that project given the um, scope and cost of the remediation that would be necessary there. But um, we expect to bring that to you, uh, if not in December, then in early January. Okay. Are there other projects that um, you guys have questions about? Gary? It's been a long, twisted tale, but suffice it <laughs> to say, it's now mid-November, and we actually are starting to put up dam signs for the safety of the dam <laughs> all these months later. Um, those should be up within the next couple of weeks. Ice dam. And uh, that yeah. project will be finished. Who owns the dam? 
bad memories. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's going to happen? Those signs are going to go when up. Can we have a really bad winter. It's going to knock the dam apart, and it won't oh. be there after we got the signs up. Oh, well. Oh, it'll be a blessing. I hope. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we can only be so lucky. We yeah. can only be so okay. lucky. Any That's other no. status? Anybody got any questions for Mike? No, I, I, you know what? I, I might. Uh, <laughs> well, you do or you don't. I mean, might. Well, this will be another, okay? Can I be pre premature? Okay, another? go ahead. You know, we, we had the tragic events in, in Pittsburgh, and since that discussion, we've now had the tragic events in Thousand Oaks, California. And so I know we were going to get a letter off to Pittsburgh to tell them we stand with them, and I was hoping we can get letters off to our elected state officials and federal officials. And I think it's, it's and, and I know the mayor is supportive of that. I, I think it's, it's better sooner than later. I know this is something Dan Chanzit, Alderman Chanzit, is, is strongly supported, and he's done a lot of research on it also. And, you know, as, as the one woman in, in, in California said when her college-age son was murdered, was that, you know, I don't want your thoughts and prayers. I just don't, don't even bring them to me. I want responsible legislation on gun control. And so maybe we can try to get something to our elected officials to let them know they need to be pushing this a lot harder. D so. Did you want me to write that? I had crafted a, a letter which I've been pa I was passing around, but I haven't had a chance yet to talk to you about it. Oh. That we were going to send in response to his first Okay. One. So if we can, All right, I'll work with I mean, Mayor on that. The, each one of those instances is a little bit different. So I don't think I can send the exact same letter to right. to each per person. But, uh, you know, you, yeah, it, it's a hard one to deal with because, you know, there's a lot of passing a buck along around this thing. You know, should it be a state law? Should it be a federal law? Uh, there's a lot of people running around the maypole on it. And nobody wants to sit down and be it. I mean, it's uh, it's a very challenging situation. And I mean, all this stuff that happens every day just seems to add, you know, more wood to the fire. And uh, we'll see where. Well, I, I would I would just caution this, and I, I don't mean to be uh, a harbinger of, of, of ill news, but you know, if all these people in all these instances, Newtown, Connecticut, all these townships. No one ever thought it was going to happen in their community, and it happened. And, and it's, it could happen here in Batavia, very, just quite that easily. And so I, I don't wish that, obviously, upon anyone. And so I just think, you know, we need to be more proactive as, as all of us as adults in the conversations with whoever we have conversations with during the day. And you have some, some hard NRA person, I mean, they have to have some reason and some, some reasonableness about them. And it's not looking to take anybody's guns or weapons. It's not looking to, to impose upon anybody's freedoms, but we just want to keep all of us safe. And so I just, I, I just pray God, and I'm not a prayerful person, but that it doesn't come to Batavia. The guy that was in Chicago last night, he had a, a legal permit to conceal carry. Mm -hmm. The, the language that I collected from Tucson, Charlottesville, um, a handful of other communities, Philadelphia, the language they used was simple. It was asking for the legislators to enact sensible gun reform and adequate funding of mental health services. I don't think that that's controversial. I really don't. It shouldn't be at all. And I think the mental health thing is probably more so the biggest problem. I mean, we always seem to forget every time the discussion comes up after something happens that it's against the law to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if you use a gun or a knife or a car, it's still, that's against the law. So the law is not what's gonna stop it. It's trying to find the root cause of the problem and get people to think that it's not okay to kill somebody. Well, it also goes to, you know, we're sending letters for incidents where there are several. Mm -hmm. How many people were killed 30 miles from here mm. oh, yeah. just on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. so, so we look at the numbers of Newtown and, and those start to lose and you get desensitized because then you start looking at those things because those are 
individual incidents, but then we don't look at what's actually going on out there day to day to day to day. And um, having dealt with that um, on a very personal level, day to day to day, it wears on you. And that's why you have suicide rates on cops or some of the highest on some of the first responders because you see that day in day out so you're right it it should just be as easy as a letter because you would think people would get it but people don't get it and they're so shocked because they don't know what a body torn apart looks like you don't see thank god and that's what we're most grateful for that we don't see the life expire out of people and the impact that that has on everybody afterwards that goes and cleans it up. That stuff haunts you forever. So if it was just that easy, dear God, I hope it would be. But until then, we're still going to have people killing and killing and killing, just like Alan said. Mm -hmm. Any other law is secondary to the first. Thou shalt not kill. That's it. And you shouldn't need more laws past that. But until you can change the human heart, and that's what, why I hope it doesn't happen to our community, because of all the things that we do, all the services that we're talking about, all the services that we support, what we talk about, changes people's minds, changes people, and gets people the help. That's why it, we don't want it to happen here. But it can, and it will. There's always going to be a time where it will. And so that's why we can't be surprised when it does happen. We should just be surprised that it doesn't happen more often. And that is a testament to our community and all of the neighborliness that we all have okay on that happy note <laughs> <laughs> any others well let me just end this meeting then tonight with thanking laura and peggy and all the department heads for all the work they put into the budget obviously we all know it's a very good budget we compliment it every time there's always room to move things around a little bit to do, come up with creative ideas but i think batavia should rest comfortably knowing that we spend a lot of time with this staff spends a lot of time trying to narrow it down as best they can and it's uh, something to be proud of that we all work on very hard and staff works on very hard mm -hmm. so with that happy thanksgiving motion to adjourn so moved. second motion by somebody second by stark all in favor aye, aye. aye. so this is